Another video on Kathy Woods in my series on Kathy Woods. Why is she investing into disruptive innovation? What is her reasoning for investment strategies? Obviously, if you follow Kathy Woods at all, she has a publicly traded fund, ARK Innovation. Her fund lost about 80% of its value because of the stock market crash. Of course, a lot of her companies are disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is very risky. A lot of these companies are not profitable. These are companies that are going to struggle when times are tough. When times are tough, companies that depend on external finance might not be able to raise more money. And if they're not able to raise more money, and if they're not profitable, and they might run out of cash at some point, they become very, very risky and investors are going to stay away from that. So a lot of her companies crashed, the value crashed. You could say that she invested in a lot of hype stocks. Maybe she's going to turn it around. She might still be the genius investor at some point. And she can also be an average investor in five years or in 10 years. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that she's horrible. It doesn't mean that her fund is horrible. It's probably a good buying opportunity at this point because what's going to happen she's pretty low stock price wise if you look at the ETF or whatever what I like to do is I like to look at some of her interviews especially at her peak when she was the god of investing the best stock picker of the year and she did a few interviews and she was hyping things and she was hyping the stocks and she talked about her strategy why is she investing in the companies responding to criticism and so on NFTs non-fungible tokens yeah. do you think those are here to stay crypto 2.0 or a passing fad or no take on it Oh, no, no, no. We're very excited uh, about it. In fact, um, Async, Async Art, Arc, did I get that right? A Async Art, I believe, uh, is, uh, is um, a firm, uh, a platform for artists, for digital artists. And what these artists can do, and I think we're going to try and do this ourselves uh, through Async Art, is you can, um, you can, uh, draw a painting. I don't know how to say it digitally, however, and uh, and then it can build up in layers. And the original artist uh, uh, holds the base layer. Anyone who wants to build on to a layer on top. Uh, when I heard that she's saying that, oh, she's very excited about NFTs, I thought, oh no, no, Kathy, you were doing so well. So of course, first of all, there's a lot of money in NFTs. Oh, let me say there was a lot of money in NFTs. Of course, they're still around, there's still money in it, but you know what I mean? There was a peak, there was a hype for the five people who don't know non-fungible token. It's basically blockchain, cryptocurrency, but it's all about digital arts where you have basically one token can be one piece of art. So instead of having a currency where every dollar looks the same, you basically have a currency where you have a green dollar, a blue dollar, a purple dollar, and then you can put a price tag on the color you like most. So it is like art because the price lies in the eyes of the beholder. Here's one token that, for example, represents the Mona Lisa. Here's another token that represents a bored ape. Here's another token from someone taking a picture of their feet. And then you can price these however you think it makes sense. Of course, a lot of things made no sense at all. A lot of things were just a cash grab and a lot of people made a lot of money from that a lot of rug pulls were going on a lot of people bought a lot of unvaluable stuff but it's so funny that she jumped on it and said it was very interesting if you're Kathy Wood and you have ARC Innovation and you have a fund that is really talking about the differentiation being the amount of research they're doing because they have a research team so she actually mentioned that in a different interview that what makes them special is that they really do deep diligence and deep research in these companies if you're that person who's doing this deep research you gotta know the name of the company, especially if you invest in them. And you for sure have to know what the product and service is. If you don't even know what the design process is called, which is very critical to whatever the company is doing, this doesn't look good. If you're the research person, the knowledge person, the I predict the future person, you gotta know this stuff. You gotta be a wizard. You can't be a dummy, right? Not saying she's a dummy. She for sure is very smart. And there's no way I'm going to punch down to Kathy Woods because she's doing very well. She's doing her thing. Of course, her fun crashed, but she she's not poor, if you know what I mean. She's doing very well at this point. But here you can already see what is really the basis of her approach is she's always trying to figure out the platform. So a platform is very powerful because a platform allows you to create an economy. So let's say I create a platform. Let's say I'm going to call it Amazon.com. Amazon.com actually has multiple platforms because they have the whole buyer and seller thing, the Amazon marketplace. So companies can 
sell on Amazon and Amazon takes a fee of everything. They have created their own economy because they have the platform. They also have Amazon Web Services. If I'm a software company and I don't want to buy servers and all of that, I use Amazon Web Services and I give them a fee and they host my data and they help me, for example, with different services. And if I grow, their fees are going to grow. So they've created another economy. And now I can keep spinning that fulfillment by Amazon. Let's say I don't want to sell on Amazon, but I want to use the Amazon warehouse infrastructure. I can even do that. I can use their warehousing, their logistics. They've created multiple platforms and I don't have to tell you how valuable these platforms are. If you create an economy, then you own that economy. It's obviously awesome. But it shows that she's looking at NFTs, she's looking at a platform and so on. She's always trying to get to the next platform because these platforms in her eyes are extremely valuable, which they are. But there's also a survivorship bias. Just because a platform that hits, hits really, really hard, a platform that misses does nothing. Or even a platform in a niche that is too small or a platform that is too easy to bypass, too easy to copy, even that platform is not going to do much. So just because it is a platform doesn't mean it's better than other business models. For example, Tesla, you can say that, hey, Tesla is just manufacturing and selling their stuff, but she's looking at the robot taxi platform, the AI. So I'm not too convinced that platforms in and of themselves are always superior and you should always go for them. But I have a feeling that she really is trying to always find the platform. I don't know where this discrimination of the business model comes from, but I'm not convinced that this is the best approach. Well, Roku, we, you know, everyone asks, uh, okay, there's a huge transition from linear TV to streaming TV. And uh, what would you invest in? Or, or where would you invest given the $70 billion of linear TV advertising dollars that are going to disappear and go somewhere? Where would you invest? Most people would say Facebook, Google. That's a, we would say a lot of people know that. That is no surprise. The surprise is Roku. Roku is becoming the operating system of streaming TV, of connected TVs. Yeah, so she is always trying to explain very nuanced thing on a very high level. And obviously when I then comment on that, it's very easy to rip it apart. Because if you talk high level, you have to generalize a lot and there's always holes in that. So what she's saying that you have all these TV advertisement dollars that are going to disappear, they're going to transition into other areas. And she is saying, hey, Roku is building this fantastic web marketplace so with roku i'm actually on the fence because i got a google tv and i tried it out and i got a roku as well but not for myself but for someone who had an old tv and this was kind of the use case because if you buy a new tv it's going to have its own operating system maybe it is roku if there's something with a manufacturer but if you buy samsung it's going to have its own thing for example so the trouble i see with roku is that it is too easy to bypass so just before i talked about not everything is a platform not every platform has so it hard. A big issue with a platform that is really good is if it is very easy to bypass, if you can get the value of the platform without using that platform, then you have a problem. Let's say Roku has an amazing advertisement system and operating system for TV. This is great. Amazing operating system for TV, just in and of itself, sorry, great. But if other companies can create an amazing operating system for TV, then what are you going to do? And what does that even mean? How hard is it to create a good operating system for TV? It's not hard. This doesn't seem to be a robust platform at all. So with Roku, what I see if they're going to be successful, and I haven't looked deeply at this company at all, but if they want to be successful, that they have to either be undeniable from a technology standpoint, meaning that whatever else you can buy, you can say it's pretty good, but it's not a Roku. Roku is the best. You can buy all of this third class stuff, but if you want to have the first class experience, you have to buy Roku. I don't think this is the truth. I don't think this is where we're at. I don't think Roku is that unique technology wise. And the other way they could win is if they have a agreements with everybody so that nobody even tries to create their own thing. And this definitely isn't a factor either because every smart TV has their own smart operating system or uses Android or they use other stuff. It's not all Roku. So I don't know what world she's living in, but I don't see what information she's basing that on that Roku really is a winner in that space. It's actually a really fun example at this point. And there's also the hypothesis that the money is going to stick to the TV screen. If you look at advertisement dollars, for example, and you say, okay, all of this money in TV is going to shift. It 
has been shifting for a long time already. This is not happening now. It's not, oh my God, the internet happened. No, this is already going on for a long time. It has been shifting for a long time. But if you think about it, why is she assuming that the money that is currently in TV advertisement is going to stay in TV advertisement? I would actually expect that TV advertisement is far less interesting than let's say PC advertisement and especially mobile advertisement. Because the best thing for an advertiser is to have a direct response. If you're selling something, if you have some whatever campaign and so on, you want people to take action to buy your product. Of course, there's broad advertisement. You just want brand awareness. Coca-Cola does stuff. They just want people to see Coca-Cola so they love it. This is fair. This is great for TV. Have a great TV ad or car ad. People believe in that brand. But if you want people to make a direct purchase decision or to directly participate, engage with the brand, follow their social media account, whatever it is, then of course, anything where you have a mouse and a keyboard and a touchscreen is better than a TV. You're not going to open an ad on your TV. You're going to do it on your mobile, on your PC. So I would imagine it's less. I don't think it's it sticks to the TV. It has to be a TV ad. TV was the only thing around next to newspapers and the radio. But with the internet, of course, the internet takes the cake because the ads there, they're direct, they're efficient. You have the analytics, they're traceable. And I think this is a factor where a whole scenario with Roku is breaking apart because people don't need the TV to run ads. The TV is just another option where they could run ads that are of a certain kind. And I don't think Roku is going to have a monopoly on that. It's going to be the best platform or even a robust platform at all. But Roku put its own channel. It has started its own channel and is starting to buy co uh, content for it. Quibi uh, is one example. It has just uh, moved on to Amazon's uh, platform as well. So we think those two, certainly in the United States, uh, are um, are going to take the lion's share of the connected TV market. And Roku uh, is moving internationally and is finding really good success. And I think that's a an upside that many people don't uh, don't anticipate. Four companies are already kind of struggling financially to some degree compared to the big competitors. To go into the content game is a whole different thing because it's so expensive. Look at Netflix. They are struggling a lot because content is so expensive. Making these TV shows and these movies, you get your Grammys, but it's really expensive to make. So Roku, I don't think they have the capital to really go into the content space where even the biggest companies are competing. That's really funny. I did a book review of Nike's Phil Knight. I'm probably not going to do more book reviews, although I actually finished quite a few other ones like Cliff Bar, which was another company, and Disney. And in Rob Iger's book on Disney, there were quite a few interesting stories also about Jeffrey Katzenberg. He appeared a few times. He appeared the first time when he told the CEO of Disney that he's never going to get the CEO position. Being completely wrong, he said, hey, Rob, you should leave the company. You're never going to be CEO. They're going to play with you and they're going to spit you out. And then he actually became CEO. So he was completely wrong. And then Jeffrey Katzenberg, he was the guy who found a Quibi, was later in a lawsuit with Disney, which was also part of the book, which is kind of funny. So I'm sure Jeffrey Katzenberg did great things, but everything I've heard of Jeffrey Katzenberg, he made him look so dumb, which is really funny. So Quibi, I made a few videos about them. They were the failed streaming service, the failed streaming app that followed the principle of, let's build it and then they come. We build the complete app. We're not going to test it. We're not going to split test it. We're just going to launch it. It's going to be amazing. They invested 1.75 billion US dollars, failed in a few months. Completely crazy, completely ridiculous. But what did Roku think? Hey, let's buy all their stuff. And that's what they did. I don't know what they did with that because a lot of it was vertical content. They had no streaming app for the PC or let's say no horizontal video. So they were all vertical. I don't know what they're going to do with that. I don't know how valuable that is because they also had a lot of new stuff and so on. And so I'm not very optimistic when it comes to Roku. So after using Roku for a little bit, I found it worse than Google TV and even worse than a Samsung TV. Didn't seem too great. It was the cheapest option. But outside of being the cheapest one, I didn't see a big differentiator where I thought, oh, this is awesome. I think Zoom is the uh, the it's playing in the largest part of the technology stack out there, the 1.5 trillion dollar uh, telecommunications part of the stack, and I think it's going to usurp a lot of the old uh, telco infrastructure. So I don't think people understand that. Uh, so we're pretty excited about it, uh, and and actually like that the sentiment right now is so negative. People think this stock at about $110 billion is selling at an outrageous multiple to sales. Uh, 
uh, it is not if uh, if our estimate for this uh, for this year is right. In fact, it's probably undervalued. I know people think that's outrageous, but stay tuned. Yeah, this is Kathy against the market again. Zoom crashed big time. I'm going to show you the stock price in the background. It's crazy because Zoom lost their edge. Of course, Zoom is still a word like Googling. So you know, okay, this is a company name, but it's also something that is synonymous with the service itself. So video calling is kind of like Zooming. A lot of teachers use it for classes and so on. But the problem is that, and I made this other video, a lot of other services are offering that. And Zoom realized that. So Zoom is now copying other services. Services. They're integrating the Salesforce, the HubSpot stuff, the Microsoft Teams stuff, the Google Workspace stuff. Now they're trying to do the whole document infrastructure and all the file sharing all of that and the calendar and the efficiency and so on. So Zoom is in trouble. So at that time, she said Zoom was overvalued. Completely ridiculous because even now Zoom is struggling to even get a fraction of the price they had at that time. So it's funny because on one side, I was thinking, okay, Kathy Woods, for sure, she's very intelligent. She's very high level. She knows what she's doing. She clearly has survived in this industry for a long time. On the other side, I'm always thinking, what is she talking about? NFTs putting money into Bitcoin because it keeps its purchasing power away from information. Now she's talking Zoom. Honestly, I don't know what to think about her, but at least it's fun content because you can always kind of look at what she's doing, what she's saying next. And I think this is the appeal of Kathy Wood. Well, we do think sports betting um, is is actually has is losing its taint uh, DraftKings is becoming a platform uh, for sports betting. Yeah, DraftKings was at an all-time high when she gave the interview and had a major crash afterwards. But you can see again, everything she's seeing as a platform, it's always about the platform. But again, a platform is just one option for a business model. This is one way to construct the way you sell your product or the way you offer and commercialize your product. But this doesn't mean that this is the most superior way. Just because a lot of the really big companies that have platforms, doesn't mean that this is what you need to do. And sometimes the definition of a platform is so vague that you're not even sure, is this a platform? What exactly does it mean to be a platform? What not it just software as a service? What are you talking about? Aren't we selling cars? Why is this a platform? So it gets very vague in some areas. Uh, we think that uh, fintech is probably one of the most misunderstood uh, of all of the technology platforms. Digital wallets. Digital wallets are going to, we believe, gut banks. So remember I told you the indexes have value traps? We think banks are among them. Sometimes I wonder if she has good takes or there's all bad takes. Because you can look back at this in 10 years and say, hey, she was right here, this is awesome. Oh, she was right here too, this is awesome. She was completely wrong here. Let's say, oh, she was so wrong here. But she was really right here. I wonder what is going to be a hit rate. Is she going to be 50% right, 60% right, 80% right, 10% right? Really interesting. Digital wallets are going to gut banks. So cryptocurrency obviously is a very interesting change. Technology. It is used in a lot of different ways. One big problem for the main use as an actual currency is always the way you have to use it, the way you have to store your keys. If you send money to the wrong address, it's gone. There's nothing you can do about it. If you lose your keys, it's gone. So there's a level of security that isn't there with cryptocurrency, and this isn't suitable for the mass consumer market because people want to know that if something goes wrong, they can complain to someone. They can say, hey, here's a problem. The money didn't arrive. Oh, this was the wrong address, we're going to fix it for you. So if we make a mistake, we want to know someone has our back. And I think this is always going to be the case. Digital wallets. So of course, this is a technical limitation. Something can be done there. You can have certain verifications before a transfer is executed where you know who the recipient is. So this obviously would change the whole crypto ecosystem, whatever you're going to use. But this can be fixed. You can make sure that there is a security layer where you don't have to deal with your keys. You let other people do it. And you want to make sure that if something goes wrong, you can get your money back. So this is all kind of fixable. Digital wallets, I'm assuming now she's talking block. This is the one that was called out by Hindenburg Research recently for being a fraud. They already responded. They say, oh yeah, thanks for the question. No, we're not a fraud. But that's what she's talking about, the cash app. You have an app, you can immediately get a credit card and you can immediately send money with very little KYC, know your customer with very little due diligence, basically banking everybody, banking people who just have a smartphone. Is this going to gut banks? I don't think so. I think 
banks are going to ride the wave. Of course, banks are not the smartest people in the room. We saw Silicon Valley Bank, we saw other banks that struggled and got bought out. But the banking industry is always going to be there because it's always going to be the center point of how we exchange value. If everything is going to be digital wallets and all of that, there's going to be banks involved with that for sure. They're not going to miss the wave. Some banks might fail, but there's going to be new banks, they're going to be the big banks, and they're going to have the new technology, and it's always going to be some type of banking industry. Think about how many industries have actually died in the past and how many of those kind of died, but they kind of also reinvented themselves. Think about oil and gas, realizing that everybody wants to phase them out. Let's look at biofuels. Let's look at electricity. Let's look at solar. They're going to transition because they have the money to invest. They're going to ride the wave for as long as they can. But if they realize there's a new wind coming, they're going to invest in that. Some might fail, but they're always going to reinvent, just like cars. Just because Ford has always used combustion engines doesn't mean that they start to invest in electric when they see that the wind is going to change. Thanks for watching. See you on the next video.